Hello and welcome to podcast Bridging Voices, the online discussion forum of the multinational development policy dialogue of the Conrad Adenauer Foundation Brussels. My name is Louis Mourier, Program Manager for Climate Policy at the Foundation, and today we're discussing the issue of global climate policy after Corona. We have two fantastic speakers for our debate today. With us is Elina Badram, Head of Unit for International Relations at DG Klima of the European Commission. Warm welcome to you, Elina. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you on this um, important podcast and, and to, to also have the opportunity to exchange views with Gita. Fantastic. And as Elina already, uh, already indicated, we also have Gita Shiarani, Executive Director of the Sustainable District Association, a leading government organization in Indonesia. Welcome to you, Gita, and great that, that you join us from Southeast Asia. Hi, thank you for the opportunity. We're very pleased to be discussing with um, Elena and also with you on a very important topic that's very relevant for our, our, our life in general. Fantastic. Um, looking a bit, a bit back to pre-corona times, I think all of us can remember that in 2019, global climate action was clearly on the rise. Uh, we had the UN Climate Action Summit, major companies were pledging substantive emissions reductions, and youth movements across the world were calling for more ambitious climate policies. Unfortunately, the pandemic has overshadowed these developments in the past months, both in the global south and in the west. Um, many developing countries are in the midst of a massive economic crisis, pushing climate change to lower levels of priority. And perhaps most notably, COP26 has been postponed to November 2021. And that is certainly a blow to a conference which many have referred to as the most important COP since the adoption of the Paris Agreement. With all of that in mind, um, I think we have to ask, how can we keep up momentum in multilateral climate politics until the end of 2021? How realistic is it to expect the Global South to implement ambitious climate policies in the next years and how to refine the EU's Green Deal diplomacy in the wake of the Corona crisis, adapting it to the changing needs of developing countries? These are some of the questions um, that we would like to address today and I suggest we get right into the, into the discussion. Elina, let me start with you and let me start with a question on COP26. You're very close to the climate negotiations on the UN level. Um, in your eyes, is there a risk that until COP26 takes place, multilateral climate affairs may lose even more momentum? Or is the postponement of the conference actually an opportunity, since it provides negotiators with more time to agree on the most controversial issues, such as, for example, Article 6 of the Paris Agreement? Thanks for, for that very pertinent question. Uh, I would start by saying that it is both. It is, of course, a risk, but it is also an opportunity. It is a risk if, if we don't uh, come together as, as an international community, as the community of negotiators, to create an alternative way of engagement. And what we have already very encouragingly seen is that the continuous conversations have not been brought to a halt you know, far from it. Uh, exchanges continue, including at ministerial level. We have seen the Petersburg Dialogue uh, in Berlin take place as it was scheduled uh, under the uh, leadership of Angela Merkel and Boris Johnson, who's the incoming COP26 presidency. Um, we know that the UK is uh, engaging in extensive outreach with its partners uh, also in view of the incoming uh, or the, the, the soon-to-be G20 presidency, which provides another uh, opportunity to build momentum. The, the situation is, is a difficult one, but it can be overcome. And indeed, as you rightly said, there are some technical issues that could actually potentially benefit from uh, the conversation, having more time to mature, for, for the parties to come closer uh, finding the convergence between their positions and actually then showing to the uh, public that the moment and the resolve remain intact. What is also important to note that uh, COP26 needed to be postponed. It is absolutely vital that we ensure inclusiveness of the process and that we ensure that um, the conditions for the ambition discussions are there. At this very present moment, the international community, including the EU, is focusing very much on the containment of the virus. However, in the coming months and in the coming year, as the virus uh, does subside, 
we will be seeing trillions of public money being mobilized to, to serve the recovery agenda. That recovery agenda has to be green because another opportunity is to really tap into the possibilities that we have to accelerate low emissions transition at a global scale through the right types of investments. And uh, that type of investment has to be uh, mindful of um, the, the kind of uh, Paris objectives, not compromising uh, the longer term transition to low carbon <coughs> economy. And also it has to be responsible because we are effectively borrowing from tomorrow's youth and uh, you know the next generation. So, so anything that would not be uh, compatible with sustainable development goals uh, with the climate objectives would be completely irresponsible and as such should not be an uh, alternative that we entertain. Yeah, um, thank you, Linus. Uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, thank you for that overview uh, where we're standing at the moment in matters of UN climate negotiations. And I actually feel a sense of optimism that, that things are still moving and that we are still moving um, in, a, in a good direction. Um, Gita, over to you. Um, Alina has just yeah. touched on the, on the need to keep up climate action, even in these difficult times, and to align the global recovery to the green transition. Um, but still, many developing countries at the moment, including in Southeast Asia, where you are from, uh, face major socioeconomic disruptions due to COVID-19. Um, some countries, as you will know, are in severe debt stress, and the capital outflows from emerging markets have been absolutely unprecedented. Um, with that in mind, can you tell us a bit to what extent is COP26 still on the agenda of Asian countries? And um, do you think that governments from the global south will be able and willing to present more ambitious national determined contributions um, in due time? Um, yeah, thank you for the question. And thank you for the um, enlightenment also, Elena, in the beginning. Um, basically, I think... What would be appropriate is to quote what the UN Climate Change Executive Secretary, Ms. Espinosa, said that um, indeed COVID-19 right now is can be considered as the most urgent threat, but climate change is still the biggest threat facing humanity over the long term. And um, I completely agree with the statement that in order to maintain momentum, what needs to be the focus right now is the recovery strategy. How do we, how do countries recover better? And uh, not only in terms of um, um, climate change in a more sort of abstract perspective, but in a more relatable day-to-day -day impact, including disaster resilience and food security and energy security, for example. Um, in, in this case, um, in terms of what the countries in, in um, um, our part of the world are currently doing, um, su surprisingly, looking at it from that angle, um, the more human-centric angle of climate impact and climate-related um, effort, um, there are significant progress on the ground. And this is just to echo what Alina said, despite the focus on dealing with uh, the pandemic that is unprecedented um, and it changes the way that everybody lives, um, we have seen some uh, positive um, momentum. For example, Indonesia um, just launched the environmental um, fund that has been created for the past seven years and supposedly the fund would accommodate um, some of the component that's referred to in Article 6 of the Paris Agreement including how accounting framework would work and how it would allow um, more transparent um, carbon accounting and trading and it will also give way for non-market approach to uh, sort of become on the rise again and I think multiple times it has been quoted, including in the EU uh, Green New Deal as well, um, that public and private financing would be key in order to push forward for a future scenario. And this is even more apparent right now when the crisis hits not only the government, but also private sector and development agencies. Um, so in terms of looking at the future, this is one um, positive momentum that maybe I can um, um, show as an example. Other examples from the Philippines and from Vietnam. Vietnam in April, um, in the midst of pandemic, um, they just uh, actually tabled a new law that focuses on uh, increasing, increasing fine for environmental crimes and um, actually increasing budget spending for environmental protection in the country. And similarly, um, in Philippines as well, um, 
in response to this pandemic, actually, um, they have issued uh, uh, a stronger push in the parliament to act more swiftly against, against deforestation and actually increase protected areas, boundaries, and environmental uh, safeguards, specifically also against investment projects that are considered not sustainable. So despite this pandemic, I think it actually shows even more how climate is something that is not up in the air. This is something that is very relatable to the way that we live and the way that we make decisions on a day-to-day -day basis. And I think government is responding to that as well. Yes, so thank you so much, uh, uh, Gita, for that overview and for, for your comments. And I'm pretty happy to hear and to see that, that climate change is still on the agenda of, of, of many, many countries in, in the global south, especially in your region. Um, but still, let me... Let me dig a little bit deeper um, into the climate development nexus and how the global south is dealing with climate change in times of corona. Um, despite the positive examples that you have mentioned, um, there are also some who say that actually there are some, let's say, worrying uh, trends in, in the past months. Uh, China, for example, has in this year already yeah. approved more coal plants than the, the entire year of 2019. And and I'm sorry for, for being perhaps a bit provocative here. Um, in Indonesia, the government stimulus package also provides significant support to gas and oil industries. Um, but still, as you, as you rightly mentioned, there are, there are some, 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 some very positive, positive developments. And also many, many people in developing countries say that taking into the account the principle of common but differentiated responsibility, there is actually a big question whether it is fair from the West in terms of climate justice to expect developing countries to move forward within, with climate um, ambition um, in times of economic crisis. Do you think it is fair to expect uh, the Global South to move forward or do we have to adapt our development policy and make it more responsive to the economic crisis that many are facing at the moment? I think in terms of, okay, this is me speaking as an Indonesian um, yes. um, sort of personal opinion. Um, and it's not, it's not about somebody else's expectation of a country. It's about um, people that actually lives in the country and how they decide they want to live. And um, in terms of um, advocating for climate commitment, um, yes, government needs to strike a balance between um, uh, social economy and also environmental protection. But to be to be frank, the NDC is something that the government is already committing themselves to. Um, the second, the second part is um, in countries like Indonesia and, and other parts of uh, ASEAN. Actually, they have integrated part of the sustainable development into their long-term and mid-term development plan. And to adapt to it in the midst of pandemic, um, we are uh, right now looking at it this way: uh, if it was um, only up to the government, and um, this is not taking into account consist constituents' voice, then um, more, more examples of, of situation that you just uh, mentioned, such as um, uh, a, greater, a greater reliance on, on brown energy um, is maybe pref the preferred scenario because it, it requires the least amount of transition. And by transition, um, I also mean a just transition, so not an abrupt one that also are not fair to the marginal community. Um, but eventually, if we count the constituent and what they want, um, uh, it shows uh, there's a large movement um, in Southeast Asia of people demanding that the government take responsibility over the commitment that they've made. And again, recovery becomes an important topic. Um, we just show, uh, we just saw a big, um, debate in the country in Indonesia over the um, uh, the recently issued national uh, priority programs that are a bit outside of what the government is promising under the midterm development plan. So um, the government is not working um, in silo. Um, they are part of they are part of a larger ecosystem of the country. There are civil society, there are youth community, there are private sector, and there are uh, definitely scientists in the picture right now. And if the pandemic is showing us anything, it shows us that that the driven decision making is indeed the way to go. And the hope is that the the science behind climate change and behind environmental protection becomes uh, even more. Um, apparent in terms of priority. So I, I don't think there's a short answer to your question. Um, countries are 
countries are backsliding because they think there's a loophole for it, but um, it's, it's, it's e it makes it even more critical for us to push for uh, a more, uh, more responsible decision making from our, our policymakers. And just to quickly add, um, the other sort of promising um, development that the EU and ASEAN is collaborating on is um, much more on the subnational level as well. So instead on, of only relying on the national government, uh, right now the the effort is also to prove that climate change action can be done on the ground. Uh, for example, the uh, EU Red um, effort um, is collaborating uh, with uh, several jurisdictions on something they call commodities jurisdictional approach, and this is uh, uh, something that our initiative is is also in uh, working very hard on, um, basically to prove that there is actually a, a big political case to push for sustainable development. Because right now, the incentives package, uh, to be completely honest, is not really apparent. So going back to the question of fair or not, I think what is needed is a strong uh, stronger market signal and um, um, sort of in, uh, incentivizing good behavior needs to be put better in the in the future climate agenda. Fantastic, Gita. Thank you so much uh, for your commitment also that you've shown to stay ambitious in, the, in, these, in these challenging times. Um, but you also touched a bit on, um, on the EU's Asia and ASEAN relations. And that brings me to another topic that, that I would like to cover today. Uh, um, Elina, Gita just highlighted the key challenges and also the key movements that we're seeing in matters of climate policies in developing countries at, and, um, at the moment. Um, the EU has responded to its own corona challenges with the substantive recovery plan, which includes the commitment to support global partners with an additional 16.5 billion euro. But if we assume, and, and please correct me if I'm wrong, if we assume that 25% of these 16.5 billion euro is earmarked for climate projects, um, as indicated by the European Commission just a few weeks ago, only around 4 billion of the EU's additional funding will flow into climate action and partner countries. So my question is, and again, I'm, I'm being a bit provocative, um, is that enough to support climate ambition in the global south? And what will the EU do in the long term to ensure its global leadership in climate politics in these difficult times? Thanks very much for that question. And um, yes, I mean, EU uh, is a long-standing defender of multilateralism and global solidarity. We're the largest donor of uh, ODA worldwide, together with our member states. And of course, uh, you know, that there is other money than the additional money that's been pushed there in the recovery package. So our commitment to climate financing, supporting our developing country partners, uh, remains uh, very solid and, and uh, will not be undermined by, by the current uh, crisis. Um, however, it is of course clear that um, uh, public money, ODA, will not be uh, the driver or an engine of the transition. What is the driver and the engine of the transition is the governments that uh, actually make the decisions about the national budgets, that decide about new large-scale infrastructure projects to prioritize, that decide about fiscal policy measures, such as uh, something that's been a positive development has been, for instance, the lifting of the VAT in China uh, for new energy vehicles which is something that stimulates exactly what Kita was referring to, the right kind of consumer behavior. So we are really at a crossroads. We have the opportunity to use the recovery money actively to reboot the old models of doing things, to look at um, different ways to transition that would not be driven by green ideology, but would be driven by uh, the job creations opportunity, the revenue generation. That's, that's what we need to be looking at when we assess the worthy investments for the public money. And the public money has to be used intelligently to catalyze the private sector investment. But at the heart of all of this transition has to be the government's own commitment to, to transition to low emissions. And that's why we in the EU, in all our documents, we point to the centrality of the climate neutrality, uh, the long-term strategies that give investors the confidence, that give uh, the economic actors and the citizens the confidence that the government itself is, is taking its responsibility to protect the citizen seriously 
and that they will deliver on it. You of course need multilateralism, you of course need collaboration, but, but you know, the government themselves are on the driver's seat in creating the conducive environment for right type of consumer behavior and, and investment behavior. Fortunately, we, we do see a lot of good positive developments that the sustainable finance activities, taxonomy, which by the way has also been picked up in China, uh, which actually introduces um, very uh, clear vetting criteria for what clarifies as sustainable and green investment, what is climate compatible. And that's the type of transparency we need to start introducing in the activities of, of different economic actors. It's, it's not something that can be driven by the governments or that can be driven by the uh, uh, private sector alone, but you need to have a kind of unison uh, complementarity of the actions between the, the different strands and you have to have the conscious consumer. And, and because climate change impacts are coming so close to people's skin everywhere, you know, it's unavoidable to, to you know, you can't deny the impacts that are so omnipresent, independent of whether you're in, in Europe, whether you're in one of the Mediterranean countries that hasn't seen rain for a really long time, or whether you're suffering from uh, floods uh, that are unprecedented and compromise your agriculture yield. So it is a joint undertaking, uh, and, and it is an undertaking that we need to really use as an opportunity to, to reboot the old-fashioned and dangerous economic model, which is still prevailing. Uh, but if you look at some of the IEA, International Energy Agency statistics, the, the options are there, the alternatives are yeah. there, but we do need to make sure that those options become accessible and that they're viable and the government see those as a real alternative to what today is very, very cheap fossil fuel. Um, because, you know, the fossil fuel investment may be cheap today in comparison, but it risks locking us into mm. a, a high carbon economic model, which is just not sustainable in light of climate science. And when we have to abandon it due to the realities that we will face, then that will be a lot of stranded assets. So, yeah, so it, exactly. it's really this type of short termism that responsible governments should not be seduced by. And, and uh, I think the EU will stand ready to, to engage with all its partners and we'll use all our avenues with the uh, multilateral development banks, the platforms that we have with the regional development banks to, to make sure that, you know, once that the recovery investment wheel starts turning big time, that we will use principles and guidelines that ensure that we do no harm, that we recover better, that we put accent on resilience, that we, you know, social just transition will be a, a top priority. And it, I'm not saying it's, it's a small task, but, but there has to be the resolve that goes beyond the community of climate negotiators and actually trickles down and up to the decision makers that make decisions about big budgets, about the, the it's about central banks, it's about, you know, uh, the lenders that will possibly be looking at debt relief, what are what are the conditions that what are the strings attached to that? And to to us that the conditionalities need to be consistent with sustainable development goals and the Paris Agreement. Yeah. Uh, th thank you so much for the very extensive overview. Um, um, uh, that was a, a strong commitment, I think, from the EU side to, to support global partners in, in these difficult times. Um, but let me follow up be, be, before we slowly have to come to an end of our discussion today. Let me follow up um, on, on one EU policy proposal that's been on the table for quite some time. And that's been also recently, uh, um, again, came, came up to the, to the forefront. Uh, and that's the, the carbon border adjustment mechanism. Uh, um, which, which um, many in the global south, but also in other parts of the world, have been very critical about, uh, calling it um, some kind of, of, of protectionism. And now the, the new European Commission and uh, President Ursula von der Leyen indicated that it may actually, the revenues of that carbon border adjustment mechanism may be used to fund and to finance the EU's recovery plans. Um, 
given that, so, given that the policy is so controversial, especially in the global south, um, is it the right time to move forward with that? And if we implement it, um, should we not rather actually use these funds and redirect them to climate projects in, in the most vulnerable countries? Thanks. Um, yes, the border measures has been a heated debate for a long time. It's always, it's always been uh, a, a possible tool for the EU. So far, we have opted for, for something that's called free allocation of, of uh, credits within the European uh, emissions trading scheme. Now, what's happening now is that the EU is looking to increase its NDC target quite significantly, which will put a, 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 quite a, a strong incentive, some may say burden, on the European energy intensive industry and uh, thereby increasing the possibility of carbon leakage. So, so which would mean that at global net level, instead of reducing, reducing emissions, the net emissions would, um, would uh, increase as European industry would relocate to countries with, with lesser standards. To avoid that kind of carbon leakage, we will be looking at um, you know, the border measures as a possible policy option. We have an impact assessment ongoing. And, and of course, uh, top priorities for us to, is to ensure non-discrimination, uh, full compatibility with WTO. And uh, you know, we will, in the first instance, be focusing all our efforts to, to positive engagement in the policy space with our partners to ensure mm -hmm. that, that indeed we all move together and that we don't create these islands of, of excellence, but rather we have a, a movement that allows us all to transition low carbon. So in a way uh, that the border measures are the option of last resort, but it is yeah. a real uh, option should we not see comparable commitment to low emissions transition by our economic partners. Mm -hmm. The EU can't be naive and just say, okay, we have Paris Agreement, everyone will surely be committed. If they're not, then we do need to, to kind of uh, take action. As what comes to the revenues, and we have uh, already used share of uh, ETS auctioning revenues for, for climate compatible activities. And, uh, you know, the details of the revenue use are still very much to be uh, designed and, and uh, as is the border measure itself. So we're, we're in very early stages and for the time being, our focus is really on the positive cooperation and making sure that we offer the opportunity for our partners to, to uh, move ahead with their policies, climate policies, climate ambition, so that we never need to use a border measure. Great. Um, thank you so much, uh, Lina, uh, for, for, for that comments. I, I know that the border carbon adjustment is not an easy topic for, for, for all of us. So thank you very much for, for your comments. Um, Gita, back to you. Um, we've just heard from Alina about how the EU intends to support climate action across the global south after Corona and, and how it already does so um, um, at the moment. Um, let me ask you, um, in your eyes, um, are there weaknesses in the EU's policy approach and which concrete expectations do you have towards the EU uh, um, and how to support uh, glo um, um, the Global South in, in matters of climate change at the moment, but also um, um, once, the, once the crisis um, um, slows down? So the short answer would be microplastic, that's one. <laughs> okay. Um, um, essentially, uh, a strongest a stronger push on um, combating my microplastic in the ocean in terms of the commitment is something that we would like to collaborate more uh, with EU. Um, in a way, this has become the bigger umbrella. I don't know if Alina agrees with me, but the sustainable production and consumption has become one of the highlight of EU and, um, and Asian uh, countries um, collaboration up until now, which is rightly so and should be something that is pushed push forward um, even even further. Um, I think Elena alluded that um, market based approach is also one way to uh, um, escalate the growth in terms of climate movement even quicker. And hopefully it sends the right signal for political leaders and for uh, public uh, sort of policymakers that this is what the constituent wants. In a way, um, I think two facts that would suggest sustainable production and consumption 
can be the essence of EU and um, ASEAN um, collaboration in the future. One is the fact that sustainability will be something that is non-negotiable uh, soon mm -hmm. for consumer in ASEAN countries. Actually, there's a research that was issued just um, early, earlier this year by Bain Consulting um, showing that 80% of ASEAN consumers um, value sustainability and actually they were willing to um, make change on their lifestyle if eco-friendlier options are accessible and available. Now, how do, how do we put more options on the shelf? That's, that's the answer. That's the, yeah. the, the, the problem that we need to solve together. Because right now, even if people are willing to pay the price, um, the, the product are not, just not accessible. And um, basically, we're looking at um, cases like telework um, in, during pandemic right now. Um, that shows a healthier lifestyle can be a long-term option. So investing on sort of the digital shift that reduce carbon footprints is one part. The, 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 the other part is actually looking at local and regional um, focused trade. Um, in a way, this is something that we're also looking at uh, as a trend. More than sort of 70% of Indonesia's current consumers um, prefer local brands uh, compared to sort of bigger global brands. And a lot of uh, multinational companies are actually investing on smaller, more local focused brand like Unilever, for example, to, mm -hmm. to name one brand. They're investing a lot on actually harvesting things that they can find in the region and develop skill set of, um, of regional uh, small, medium scale enterprises in order to produce such products. And because of that, we are looking at continuing trend in Korea, in Japanese, in Chinese brand, and right now even more in ASEAN brand coming from the, Thai, the Thailand, the Philippines, and even Indonesia. Even in category uh, on higher, like slightly higher technology, like uh, uh, smartphones, um, um, health, uh, medicinal um, uh, substances and extract. So looking at that as the um, center of um, EU and ASEAN relationship in the future, I think would provide what Alina mentioned, a realistic overview of what climate neutral feels like for people. Um, it provides jobs, it provides economic certainty, and it provides higher life value for, for people in the region. So this is the message that we need to make sure come across. Climate change doesn't belong to negotiators. Climate uh, issues doesn't belong to the government. It actually belongs to the people and the people would be the one that is benefiting out of the effort. Fantastic. Thank you so much for, for, for these comments, uh, um, Gita. I think, Alina, that these were some pretty, pretty clear expectations, especially when it comes to sustainable production, sustainable consumption, the availability of, of eco-friendly products, uh, um, the fostering and promotion of local brands in, in developing countries. Um, I give you the floor for, for the final time and today, afterwards we, we have to come to an end, but um, do you have any, any concrete um, um, yeah, reactions to, to the expectations of, of um, of Gita and um, how do you think we could refine uh, the EU's climate development nexus and the EU's green deal diplomacy um, based on what uh, what Gita just said? Thanks very much indeed. Gita was saying uh, lots of things that we've been reflecting on as well, and uh, you know the, the EU's. Uh, climate policy is is not something that's considered environmental policy anymore. You know, we've just forward come forward with our industrial strategy, our new circular economy strategy, with a green investment strategy. So, so um, you know, it's good to have an objective, but if you don't have the underpinning policies, if you don't have the the drivers in terms of reform, it's just not going to happen. Hmm. So, so, you know, um, you need to incentivize the right kind of uh, behavior by the consumers, by the businesses. You have to reward the, the right type of uh, behavior in order to, to balance out the costs as well. And you have to really invest in research and development to, to make sure that you you know, we use waste intelligently. There's so much, it's not just microplastics, it's, you know, there's uh, urban mining of, of uh, you know, e-technologies that's been considered waste, uh, offers a huge resource for, for the low carbon industries, etc. Mm -hmm. So it is about um, really embracing circularity at a completely different scale and becoming intelligent 
consumers. Um, and, and then for, for the governments to incentivize that type of model. So, so we're, we're definitely very much working on our plastic strategy. We'll say all the right things on, on microplastics, etc. <laughs> and it's clear that uh, the EU cannot do any of this on its own. So, so we will be redoubling our diplomatic efforts at different levels of government because you know, we, we don't need to talk with the converts we really need to reach out to the tough, hardcore industries that consider that there is no alternative. And we need to, to offer a realistic uh, model of change. Otherwise, uh, it's not going to happen. But we'll, I mean, it's work in progress, super committed, and, and we need partners like Gita in, in the global south to, to help us identify, identify the strategic openings to influence um, the governments and the businesses. Thanks. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Alina. Uh, thank you so much also to, to Gita. Thank you very much for a very rich debate. Um, I felt a lot of optimism today and, and it's a lot of good spirit to, to move forward um, in the next month, both at COP26, but also and beyond uh, when it comes to fiscal policy uh, um, and engagement with consumers and the long-term EU development um, strategy. Um, in that sense, uh, thank you very much to all of our listeners that joined us today. Um, we will be back very soon with a new fresh discussion, bridging the gap between the EU and the Global South. Um, in the meantime, we invite you to follow us on LinkedIn, Twitter and Facebook. You can find all the necessary links in the description. Again, thank you very much uh, to Alina and to Gita. I hope to hear from you very soon again. And uh, we look forward for the, for the next discussion. Until then, stay safe and goodbye.